Lord be with you. Welcome this morning to our third Sunday in the season of Lent. We are officially in the half of Lent, um, and it's four weeks until Easter. If you were a baptism candidate um, in, in the past, traditionally, you would be uh, really in the heart of your fasting pangs, and um, but the end would be coming into sight, and excitement would be building. As we read through the readings, uh, we see that it's a preparation, it's a baptism preparation course, as I'll be saying more about later. Let us please stand as we sing our opening hymn, number 379, uh, the tune is different, one number 143, Jesus Shall Reign. commandments that the Lord our God spoke. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in the heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water below. 
You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his servant, his do ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. We return to the prayer book to the Kyrie. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one. The Lord be with you. We turn to the collect for today as we join in our prayer together, saying, Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may be defended from all adversities which may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts which may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the Old Testament reading by David Falk. I do apologize for the small font and indeed the small bulletin. Uh, the photocopier threatened to give up the ghost because the toner tank was full yesterday. And when that happens, you never know when it's going to die. So we decided to keep it simple so we could finish the job. Thank you, David. The first lesson is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jephro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock be beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here, are, here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out, bring them up out of the land to, be a, to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Then you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, the, Lo the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, 
and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, David. A wonderful reading of a very seminal passage. Well, let us join together in the psalm as we do, from side to side, the whole verse beginning on this side. O God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a barren and dry land where there is no water. For your loving kindness is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. <coughs> my soul is content as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul thinks to you, your right hand holds me fast. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is read to us by Novel. Peaceful reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with the most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now those things occurred as an example for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the, to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example, as they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength but with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Nolly. Let us stand and sing our gradual hymn, number 338. The tune is 102, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, 338. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. At that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it, and if it bears fruit the next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray, Lord. We pray that even as uh, last week we are challenged uh, in our faith to have confidence in the resurrection of Christ and in our covenant relationship with you. So this week may we also be challenged to repentance from sin and to, uh, that we may uh, not fall uh, but may stand firm in our faith. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, Uncle Sir, I'm going to ask you to please close the door, if you wouldn't mind, just to shut it too, so because it's slightly blinding in my eyes. Thank you. Um, well, it's so lovely to see you all here today. Um, welcome. Nice, nice to see you, all, all the friends here. Is that Michael behind the mask? Yes. <laughs> Great to see you. We, we have the groom here. Uh, Michael and Hilda got engaged last week, so can we say congratulations to Michael? <laughs> Lovely to have you uh, joining here with us, uh, even without your future bride. It's lovely to see you. Um, well, this morning, uh, as we uh, go through the, um, the readings, uh, you need to have some awareness of what has gone before in, in the previous, previous weeks. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit mean, and, and, and probably if, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't know the answer to this question, because uh, it's a little unfair, because you've just woken up and uh, had your coffee and your breakfast, hopefully, and come in this morning. But can anybody remember what the readings were about two weeks ago, the first Sunday in Lent? Now, you can figure it out if you think about it. Lent is 40 days and 40 nights, fasting in preparation for the baptism celebration at Easter. So what might be the first focal reading for the beginning of Lent? Exactly, the temptation of Christ in in the desert. Were you here or are you just a clever person? You were here. Oh, well done. (laughs) Jolly good. (laughs) Right, exactly. The, The temptation of Christ in the desert by Satan and the three temptations of Christ. So imagine that you are a baptism candidate and you're preparing for baptism on Easter Day. And you're going through these 40 days uh, of fasting and preparation. And the first lesson that you have uh, on the first Sunday is a reminder of Jesus' 40 days and how he went through 40 days of prayer and fasting and temptation in the wilderness. And we looked at the three temptations. The temptation to take the easy road or or greed, stones into bread. The temptation to idolatry, to worship uh, gods other than God, even in that case to worship the devil in that particular temptation of Jesus. And thirdly, the temptation to pride and insecurity. Uh, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down and show off your power. So he faced these temptations. Then last week, we had a very strange collection of readings, which at first glance, it seemed hard to figure out how they all fit together. But then they fell into place. I wonder if anybody can remember the Old Testament reading. It was about a very well-known Old Testament character last week. Does anybody remember? Abraham, Abraham exactly. Or Abram, as he's called in that particular story um, in, in Genesis. Uh, and it's not only just about Abraham, but about the very seminal and uh, foundational story of the cutting of the covenant, 
where God, Abraham is told to lay out the sacrifice for the first covenant. And God himself cuts the covenant by sending a flaming torch through between the pieces of the animals that are laid out. So God himself cuts the covenant with Abraham. Normally in ancient sacrifice, uh, man would cut the covenant with gods. But in, in the original Judaic covenant, God is the one who cuts the covenant. He is the one who passes the fire of God uh, in the form of a smoking fire pot through the midst of uh, the, the pieces that are cut in half. And God initiates the covenant promises with Abraham. And you remember the four promises that God makes. That the promise of descendants, that he would have an heir. The promise of, of land. The promise of a great name, that he would be known throughout the world. Uh, and that his descendants would make a mark on the whole world. And lastly, the promise that the whole world would be blessed through him. And I said to you that the story of the Bible is the story of the fulfillment of those promises. So last week was about a covenant-making God who invites us into relationship with him and makes promises to us and asks us to make promises to him. Uh, and in the epistle last week, it's about the resurrection because that's the heart of our faith. Our faith is in Christ, the risen Christ, the resurrected Christ. As Paul says, if Christ isn't risen, then uh, we are not saved, we are still in our sins, and, and the Christian faith is meaningless. So we had first week, the temptation of Jesus. That's the beginning of the Lenten journey, 40 days and 40 nights. Last week, the second week, we have this foundational story of Abraham, which is about who is God. God is a covenant-making God, enters into a relationship with us, and the key word for last week, beginning with F, is faith. Okay, stand firm in your faith. Do you remember the epistle at the end when I talk again about the, 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 the metaphor in the Roman military of standing firm, stichete, stand firm, put your pilum in the ground, put your spear in the ground, face the oncoming temptation, face the attacks of the devil, and stand firm in your what? Faith. Now, when you come to baptism, there are two criteria for baptism. I, I don't know if Hugo can remember from his baptism class. That's a very hard question. Very naughty of me to ask him. But maybe mum and dad can remember. What were the two conditions for baptism? One was belief or faith. What was the other one? Anybody know? There are two conditions for baptism. Yes. Uh, or as I said to Hugo, but believe and behave, or faith and repentance. So if last week's readings were about our relationship with the covenant-making God, the foundational story of Abraham, how, how humanity comes into relationship with God through the cutting of the original covenant, which you remember was the covenant of grace, not a covenant of works, as many will say. The covenant with Moses is a covenant of works and law, but the covenant with Abraham is a covenant of grace. Abraham believed God, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. So it's, it's really a foundational story for Christian baptism. Well, can you guess what today's readings are about? If last week was about faith, what are this week's readings about? What are the two conditions again? Faith and repentance. So what's today's readings going to be about? Repentance. And sure enough, today's readings give us a slightly different, another angle on God. They give us the holy God, the God who requires repentance, the God who abhors sin, the God who warns us that if we don't repent, we face judgment. So last week we had the covenant-making, loving, tender, relational God who comes alongside us and makes us wonderful promises like all our Christmases are going to come at once. This week we have the holy God in the burning b -b -b bush. Okay, I did that deliberately. Um, in case you were wondering, in the past, maybe not so much, but the burning bush. So uh, he's, the, the, he's the, the holy God who is to be feared. We need to take off our shoes because we are standing on holy ground. So you have this, again, another Old Testament foundational story. Um, first, Abraham, the cutting of the covenant. Now, Moses, two of the big guns of the Old Testament. And Moses is the patriarch of law. Law means sin. If we break the law, we sin. And if we sin, we need to 
Repent. You got, you're getting it. Okay. So you pretty much got the sermon now. Okay. You got the idea. This is a baptism preparation course. And actually, you know, looking at these three, I'm, I'm really excited to see what comes next week because I haven't looked ahead. I'm like, what's it going to be? You know, um, excuse me. I've never made this connection before, but when I was trying to figure out what the readings meant last week and this week, it jumped out at me. I realized these strange readings that seem unconnected are actually very clearly and powerfully connected. Um, it's funny because I, I've asked uh, Matthias to read the read as a sort of practice. He's leading the teenagers for the McFeast group at the second service. So I've, I've asked him because they finished the Youth Alpha. So I've asked him each week to read and study the readings and to try and figure out how they're connected and what they mean so he can explain it to the, to the kids. And last week, last night, he messaged me and he said, I have no idea what they mean and how they're connected, how they're all connected. And I was just figuring it out myself as well. So we had a chat conversation and, and talked about how they were connected. And of course, one connection is Moses. The Old Testament is about Moses and the epistle also talks about Moses. Uh, and another connection is holiness, sin and repentance. So today's news is, is kind of challenging because it's really... A harsh message. It's a very uncompromising message that God is holy, that he doesn't tolerate sin. And it's also replete with warnings. Today's message says, uses the metaphor. It's actually Paul in, in Corinthians is, is writing uh, a Christian letter, but he uses the story of Moses as an allegory. And he says, you remember your ancestors who went through the cloud and through the sea. And he says that was like baptism. Like you Christians, you're preparing for baptism or you've been baptized. You've been baptized into Christ in the waters of baptism. Well, your ancestors were baptized into Moses and into the law. And they drank the spiritual drink from the rock. That got, you know, Moses struck the rock and the water came out. And they drank the water from the rock and they had the manna from heaven and they ate the spiritual food. So actually, he's not talking about Moses. He's talking about communion. He's talking about baptism. And he's saying to the Christians or the would-be Christians, be careful. You think that you are baptized. You think that you take communion. You think you are safe and standing firm. And he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with, your ans with most of them. And they were struck down in the wilderness. And, so, and then he says, these things happened as an example for us. Because although they'd been baptized into Moses and into the law, although they were partaking of the water from the rock and the manna from heaven, which for us is, is the Eucharist, the spiritual food from heaven, the body and blood of Christ, although they were partaking of these things and, and members of these things, and yet they were idolatrous in their heart, and yet they were indulging in sexual immorality. They were testing Christ, he says, which means, what does that mean, put Christ to the test? That's not another example of a type of sin. You see, you've got, you've got idolatry, sexual immorality, and complaining. Those are three kinds of sin. But putting Christ to the test is all of those things. When we, when we as Christians who are baptized and who love Christ and follow Christ, when we indulge in idolatry, when we indulge in sexual immorality, when we indulge in complaining all the time about God and how he's treating us, then we are testing Christ. Because we are, we are saying, well, Lord, Lord, you've saved us, but I can just whinge and sin and, and, and you're still going to save me, right? You see, that's testing Christ. And Christ is saying, no, maybe not. So it's, it's a, you understand it's a warning. It's testing Christ. Saying, well, I'm baptized. I'm in communion. I, I'm, I'm, I've arrived. It's okay. So he's warning them against a shallow confession. He's saying, don't come to your baptism on Easter Day and say, oh, I follow Christ, I believe, yes, I make my baptism promises, but then continue with your idolatry and your, your lust and your sexual sin, your immorality and your whinging and complaining about how, what God is doing or not doing in your life. He says, if you do that, you're putting Christ to the test. And, you know, he might not like it, just like in the Old Testament, he didn't like it. So he says at the end of the epistle today, if you think you are standing, you're, you're firm, you're baptized, you're confirmed, watch out that you do not fall. You see, this is a, a warning to the baptism candidates. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful. He will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will provide the way out so that you can endure 
the testing that you are to face. So the, the message is both stark, it's a warning, but there's also a, a degree of grace in it. There's a degree of comfort. It's saying, well, okay, if you, if you are still struggling with sin, God will strengthen you. He will give you a way out. He will help you to say no to those sin in your life. You need to turn to him um, and, and don't come to your baptism and make a shallow profession of faith while really secretly you're still in sexual immorality or in, in whinging about God things or complaining or uh, um, committing idolatry on the side or whatever. So this is really the heart of the matter. Uh, last week was about faith. Stand firm in your faith. Today you could summarize uh, the message by saying repent or perish. That would sum up today's readings. So it's pretty stark, right? So we get to the gospel, and the gospel is interesting because it begins with these two stories. The story of the Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with the sacrifices, and the story of the Tower of Siloam, which fell on killed 18 people. Now, we don't know a whole lot about what, what is behind these stories. We have some ideas about what they might refer to. In a way, it's not important. They're stories about natural disasters or man-made disasters, depending how you want to characterize them, I guess. Uh, disasters which happened to hapless Galileans and hapless Jerusalemites. And uh, he, he says that some asked Jesus, um, do you think it's because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners? And Jesus says a resounding no. Now, in Jewish religion, uh, there was this belief that uh, sin and suffering were rigidly connected. So in the story of Job, Eliphaz says, who that was innocent ever perished? So Eliphaz, Job expresses this idea that we suffer because we're not innocent, we, we've sinned. So Job is making the connection between sin and the suffering in the world, which is, you know, part of Christian doctrine, that sin is in the world, that, sorry, suffering is in the world somehow in a spiritual sense because of human sin. But Jesus utterly denies a direct causal relationship between individual suffering and individual sin. So, and, and more than one occasion when he's asked this, you know, is this man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? Jesus says, neither. Basically says, you know, shut up, you know, neither. Uh, it's because the, the glory of God can be revealed. So again here, he says, no, I tell you, no, I tell you. There's not a causal relationship between those people's sin and their suffering. Even saints suffer. However, there is a causal relationship in Scripture between national sin and national suffering. We all get caught up in the sins of the nation. And the Russian people at the moment are suffering. Many of them may, you say, be innocent. Um, and that's true. But they're going to suffer economically. They're going to suffer uh, in terms of their businesses and their personal lives and their travel and their freedoms and all sorts of suffering because of the decisions of, of Putin and their government. Um, and likewise, the Ukraine is also suffering for the sins of their past leaders and the mistakes that have been made by their past leaders. So there is such a thing as national sin. And there's a connection between national sin and corporate suffering. But that's really not the point of, of these two stories. Uh, by the way, just as a little, a little interesting aside, um, one commentator that I read says that there could be a story that's behind this, that Pilate um, had a scheme to build an aqueduct. You know, the Romans were always improving the, um, the water system of, of the towns that they, they governed. And one of the ways the Romans loved to do that was to bring fresh water into the town to help alleviate disease and so on. Unfortunately, they lined their, they lined their freshwater aqueducts with lead, which wasn't so healthy. Um, but they did get sort of fresh water in the short term and lead poisoning in the long term. At any rate, <laughs> that's an aside. They, they loved building aqueducts, and they built beautiful aqueducts uh, all over their, their world. And, uh, and Pilate had proposed to build an aqueduct, but he came up with a very clever idea. You know, it's like church council meeting uh, or, a, or a, from the vicar of Dibley or um, you know, a, a yes minister kind of scene where he decided that he would use the money from the temple treasury. And he thought this would be a really good idea. You know, well, of course, it didn't go down very well with the Jews because the money in the temple treasury belonged to God, not to Pilate. So when he used the money from the temple treasury to build the aqueduct, 
there were tremendous revolts and, um, and protests in the city. And so Pilate decided to suppress the revolts, but without bloodshed. So he sent his, the centurion with the cohorts into the crowd without swords, but with cudgels. So they had clubs and they were to suppress the rioters and disperse the crowd and send them home. But the Roman soldiers suffered from an over excess of enthusiasm and perhaps an over resentment of being posted to Palestine in the first place. And so they got their, cudgel, they got their cudgels out and they broke some skulls. And, uh, and there was blood on the saddle, so to speak. There was blood everywhere. So Pilate's plan failed. In fact, people got killed and heads got broken. And it was a mess. And um, so it's possible that, that we know that from the history. So it's possible that this is a reference to that, that, that Pilate went into the temple uh, with his soldiers. And the, the people were protesting in the temple against the stealing of the, the temple treasury funds for the building of the aqueducts. And he had them badly beaten up and the soldiers got carried away and blood flowed. So it might be a reference to that. And indeed, the second story is even more obscure, but it's possible that, that the tower was part of the aqueduct and, and that the tower had fallen on workers, Jewish workers, who were being paid with temple treasury money. See, this is one theory. So in other words, those guys were sinners. They were Jewish faithful who had taken jobs from the hated Romans to build the aqueduct um, because it was aqueducts involved huge t tall towers and sections and so they were really sinners because they were taking the temple treasury money uh, as pay which a good Jewish person wouldn't do so they were traitors and they were sort of in cahoots with the Romans and so the tower fell on them so the Jews all thought oh that's good that's good and our God has punished them God has thumped them because they sold out to the enemy you see and Jesus says, no, I tell you, it's not individual punishment. But then he goes on and he says, but unless you repent. And the second time, no, I tell you, but unless you repent. So he's saying, no, that wasn't individual judgment of God for the individual sin. But if you don't repent, you will be judged for your individual sin. You see what he's saying? So he's saying, God didn't judge those Galileans. He didn't judge those workers because they, their individual sin, but he will judge us because of our individual sin. So it's a very stark warning, repent or perish. And you know, that's really the message today. It's, it's kind of harsh, it's kind of stark. It has some grace in it because we are reminded that we can, in the epistle, we're reminded that, that God is testing us. So again, you know, there's this idea of the baptism candidates. It's like they're saying to them, this is a test. You're preparing for your baptism. It's a test. Are you willing to repent of your idolatry? Are you truly willing to repent of your sexual immorality? Are you truly willing to repent of your complaining? See, complaining is rebellion. It's, rebellion. it's one of the great original sins, rebellion against God. Are you truly willing to come to the Lord and surrender uh, in true faith and repentance? And it's saying, if you do, God will help you. He'll strengthen you. He'll give you the way to do it. He'll enable you to do it. So there's grace there, but there's also a very heavy warning. So last week was Stichete. Stand firm in the faith of the resurrection. The resurrection is the heart of the matter. And this week's message is repent or perish. In the epistle, there are these three sins mentioned. Maybe a way to conclude is for us to meditate on the sins of idolatry, immorality, and rebellion, complaining. And to ask ourselves, as people who are already baptized, those who are already standing firm in our faith, are we secretly falling down? I know I am. I know I do fall down in these ways. I complain all the time. I'm tempted to lust uh, and sin in my heart all the time. Um, and I'm sure there are idols in my life that I worry about far too much, other than God's will and purpose for the world. So you can ask yourself as we conclude this and as you prepare to renew your baptism vows. You see, because for us as Christians, we're not getting baptized, but on Good Friday and on, on Easter Saturday night, the church would traditionally renew baptism vows on the Saturday night service uh, uh, or at the dawn service on Easter. We would renew our baptism vows. So as you come to renew your baptism vows, ask yourself, are you standing firm? And so it says in the epistle today, so if you think you are standing firm, 
watch out that you do not fall. So I hope you find it interesting. I, I, I've, I find it fascinating. I, you know, it occurs to me, um, looking at these readings, that this is a curriculum. And these days, we have the kind of view that church is the same every week. We come and have a little bit of church. And we get our little dose of church. And we go on with our week. And it's the kind of mentality that we have. And as I preach through the lectionary, I, at the grand old age of 61, it's really dawning on me in a fresh way that this is not like a little weekly dose of church. This is a curriculum. It's a curriculum. And would you send your children to school, you know, once a month or every two months? Would you just go and say, oh, have a bit of school today? Uh, no school today? Okay, let's go and play in the park. Um, okay, let's stay home and watch cartoons. And then, and then next month, have a little bit of school today. We wouldn't do that because we need the curriculum. And so, you know, I don't mean to say this to put guilt on anyone. I would be the, if I, if I wasn't paid to be good, you know, I'd be good for nothing. You know, I go on holidays and I'm like, let me sleep in. And my wife is, no, you're the pastor, you're the priest, get up, we're going to church. I'm like, oh, it's holidays, let me sleep in. She's like, get up, we're going to church. You know, so I, I come before you as a fellow sort of sinner in, the, in this regard. But I, I really, I think there's an appeal here for us. That as Christians, we need to put aside that, of course, there are always things that come up. There are always work things that are unavoidable. There's family commitments that we can't escape. Sometimes we need to travel and have leave. But in general, are we people who see church as just something we have a bit of occasionally? Now, I think most of you are here because you don't see it that way. You, you are faithful. You do come regularly. Pretty much all of us do. But I just it just really struck me in a fresh way. So I wanted to share that with you today, that... Church is not like, it's not like a meal. It's not like we have a meal, so we need another meal in, an, in 24 hours. It's a curriculum. It's a course. And it's, it's based on the life of Jesus. And we need to see the, the whole course. We need to see the curriculum. And that's why every three years we go through it again. Because we miss a lot of it the first time, uh, unfortunately. And we need to be reminded. So today is some, some challenges that come out of the readings uh, for us. Let's take a moment to just be silent and to reflect uh, on this call to, as we go through the 40 days and 40 nights of, uh, of fasting and preparation to renew our baptism vows, let us uh, take a moment to repent of our idolatry, our immorality and our rebellion. Friends, let us stand and um, we turn to page four. As we turn in unison to face the rising sun, we declare together we believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten not made, one body with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scripture. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Dear friends, let us pray for the world and for the church throughout the world. Today we are praying for Mexico in the Anglican Communion. We will take uh, from four, page 32. 
Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant that Almighty, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the way of justice and peace, that we may all honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all reference for the earth at your own creation, that we may use its resources highly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all who live are closely linked with us and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loved us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joys for your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We command to your mercy all who have died, that your will be for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we ask in faith, grant that we may obtain in effect to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbour as we say, Most merciful God. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive what we have been, amend what we are, and direct what we shall be. We may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Dear friends, hear these words of absolution and forgiveness. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sin through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May we stand for the greeting of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another with the peace and the shalom, the blessing of Christ. I sent out a text message with the highlights of upcoming events this week. Not everybody is on the text system, so I just mentioned a couple of things. Um, one is that um, the Lent and study books finally arrived <laughs> three weeks into Lent. Um, actually, only seven people ordered them, and because they're three weeks late, I think we'll just give them away. So if you would genuinely like to, to read one, um, I, I'll give them to someone who's going to be hanging around that would help me. Uh, it's basically there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So first come, first serve. Okay, thank you, Professor. So um, you, if you're, uh, it's a little bit theological, you know. So it's not it's not really a personal Bible study kind of thing. Uh, it's a little theological reflection uh, for Lent. So if you if you'd enjoy that, then please take one from Brian. 
They were to cost 100 mop, but I don't have the heart to charge you since um, all of you give and support the church anyway, and it's halfway in the middle of Lent, so it's ridiculous. Um, if you didn't get the bulletin last week, I have some copies of last week's bulletin as well. May as well also give them to Professor Doug as well. So if you'd like a bulletin from last Sunday and you missed out, uh, you can get that because it has uh, all the upcoming events. Just to highlight that um, this Wednesday is the church prayer meeting. Um, Friday, the young adults are going for dinner just near here at the Puffin Cafe. Uh, the Saturday the 26th is International Ladies' Night at Jolene's home. That's quite a lively fellowship now. Uh, more than 20 ladies or so will sometimes gather. And they're studying Acts. They're up to Acts chapter 10. That's this Saturday night. If you'd like to join, please ask me. I can put you in touch with Jolene. Um, next Sunday is Mothering Sunday. For those of you from the English tradition or the Commonwealth tradition, next Sunday is English Mother's Day or the Commonwealth Mother's Day. So we want to wish Happy Mother's Day in advance to all the, all the mothers. It's traditionally a time when Christian Anglicans would go back to their mother church. Uh, well, you can't do that, I'm sorry. But we can wish our mothers a happy Mother's Day. And uh, Eddie is going to be making the morning tea. It's very appropriate. The men are making the tea for the mums. So there you go. And um, also next Sunday, if you help with Sunday school, don't forget this Sunday school teacher training meeting at 9.30 next Sunday. And Team Jesus are practicing at 10 a.m. at Mac. The men's group is coming up. It'll be a social gathering this time on the 31st of March. Last but not least, uh, please sign up for the Ellis Benefit Dance. Um, this confused people because we put out a sign-up sheet and we asked what food will you bring. The food is secondary. People thought it was a sign-up sheet to bring food. It's primarily a sign-up sheet to say, are you coming? Because we want an idea of numbers, to estimate numbers. So please, if you can come, please do come. That's the first thing. Uh, we'll have an offering during the proceedings uh, for Ellis's future care. Um, and secondly, um, secondly, if you can bring some food, we're going to have a potluck lunch. So it will be immediately after the 11 o'clock service, starting at 1 p.m. Uh, we will have food and the band will strike up. And um, also we're inviting uh, uh, performances, but we just really want good performances. Uh, not, not like church camp lousy performances, <laughs> if, I, if I dare say that. Um, I won't say that at the second service, but you know what I mean. Um, so, yeah, please do sign up if, if you can. Um, we don't want to torture people. Yes. Um, okay. So do, but do please sign up if you can sing a song um, or play an instrument or dance or something or tell a, read a poem. That would be lovely. Um, all right. There was probably something else, but I can't remember what it is. So never mind. Let us sing our offertory hymn. Number 64, Break Thou the Bread of Life. Thank you, friends. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. No, move over. One, just move one.
us offer a sacrifice to God of thanksgiving and make good our vows to the Most High. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us. We pray together the offering prayer on page 8 as we say together, Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All, All things come from you. Let us turn to Eucharistic Prayer C. It's found on page 15. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race, and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we have turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts of bread and wine. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, that we who eat and drink at this holy table may share the divine life of Christ our Lord. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great I Am, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord, be known to us in the of the world. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your Church gives honour, glory and worship from generation to generation. As our Saviour Christ taught his disciples, we are confident to pray, Our Father in heaven. Dear friends,
things. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. And let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. The blood of Christ. The cup of salvation. Let us turn to page 25. The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it and if it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Let us pray as we give thanks for these mysteries, saying, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage. 
to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Lord. And the blessing, may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for coming, dear friends. I'm guessing the morning tea is probably on the side. It's um, supposed to be 80% chance of rain at 11, so it might be raining in the next little while. So let us uh, stand and we'll sing our closing hymn this morning, number 16, All My Hope on God is Founded. Thank you for coming. It's so lovely to have a, such a full chapel these days. So lovely to see you all.